Hello, stat 101. We have been walking down a little pathway for a while now. This pathway is all about uh, inferential statistics. And that's where we go and we gather uh, a sample from a population and uh, we measure things like proportions or uh, means, things like this, differences between proportions, um, and we infer something about the broader population. And so just as a slight recap, um, we started off uh, looking at uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests uh, for a proportion. p hat, and in the confidence interval we would go p hat plus or minus some z alpha over 2 times the standard deviation, which turns out to be the root of p hat 1 minus p hat over n. And we also had a hypothesis test where we had the test statistic uh, p hat minus p naught over the root of p naught 1 minus p naught over n. So we have this uh, in our formula sheet for one proportion. And we went on and said, oh, now we're going to do two proportions. In fact, we only did a, a, a hypothesis test in this case for two proportions. And so it's a p1 hat minus p2 hat. And we have a test statistic for that as well um, with its associated standard deviation. The formulas are a little bit different, but everything else basically is the same. Um, we have our uh, standard normal uh, test statistic. It's in the, it's, it's a, a Z score essentially. We walked down a little bit further and said, okay, now we're going to look instead of proportions, we're going to look at means. And we did confidence intervals and hypothesis tests uh, for a mean uh, X bar. And so in each of these cases, we are using these statistics p hat, x bar, p1 hat minus p2 hat, and we're using those to infer about the population parameters. Now, in this case, it would be p1 minus p2. In this case, it's simply the proportion uh, of the population p. And in the case of a mean, uh, we're inferring about the broader population, and we use mu to refer to the mean of the population. All right, well, um, if we're continuing on down this road, we might ask ourselves, what's next? Um, well, the next thing is uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for two means. And uh, then I would use some mean of one sample, and maybe I'll look at the difference in the mean of the second sample. And this statistic is going to be used to infer about the population difference of two means, mu1 minus mu2. Okay, so again, this is a population, this is for the population, this is for the population, this is for the population, and these red here maybe, this is the sample, this is from the sample, this is from the sample, and now this is also from the sample. So this stuff here is our next topic. And so what we're looking at is a case where we might have two different uh, populations that we're comparing against one another. And uh, so what we're gonna do is look at the uh, difference in population means. That doesn't look very clear. Fix that up. All right. And to do this, uh, what I'm going to do is use an example uh, that's based on uh, some midterm score data for this course a couple of years ago. And uh, what I did is I just split it into uh, females and, and, and males and looked at uh, class performance on midterm in these two categories. So one population is female, one population is male. And I will uh, note that 
uh, it's worth mentioning that this binary way in which we uh, split gender in these kinds of examples ignores uh, the spectrum upon which some people lie uh, in, in terms of their gender. Uh, but we will oversimplify and um, categorize as such. So uh, let's consider, um, I'm really comparing mu1 versus mu2. Okay, and so I'm going to give you some statistics based on this midterm performance from a few years back, and we're going to have two classes, one, not uh, two, two groups, not, not different stat classes. These are two groups. One, uh, group one are going to be the females, group two are going to be males. And in this particular example, uh, it's a stat class, and so typically stats classes have more males than females, and that was the case in this class as well. The number of females in the class was 33, who wrote the midterm, uh, and the average of the sample of females, which was 33, was uh, on the midterm 66.1. The standard deviation for that group was 21.2. So those are the test scores. Now, this sample is from my class, and so we might allow uh, the population to be something like uh, all females enrolled in uh, stat classes or something like this, something broader that contains this particular sample. So we're going to go on to the males now. And the males, N2. Uh, there were 60 males in the class. Their average was a bit lower. It was 61. And the standard deviation is quite similar. Uh, turned out to be 23.2. And so I have this data here. And what I want to do is start uh, looking for ways to uh, compare these two populations together. And so the first thing I'm going to do is talk about a confidence interval. All right, so what I want to do is build up an interval for the difference between these two uh, means for these populations. Okay. So I'm going to first start, I'm going to do like a 90% confidence interval for this new parameter, mu1 minus mu2. Okay, this is the difference in population means. And what I'm going to do is use my sample data to build up an interval where 90% of the time I expect these intervals to contain the true population difference. All right. The formula is straight from the formula sheet. It will be the second last box in the formula sheet. It's called confidence interval for difference in population means. Now that formula is similar in structure to all these other confidence interval formulas. I first look at the sample difference, and then I add on the standard, uh, or the, sorry, the margin of error. And so there's going to be some t alpha over 2 value, and then a standard deviation. The standard deviation in this case has to use both uh, sets of data. So it's s1 squared over n1 and s2 squared over n2. That's the formula. And um, we have all the numbers. If you look here, we have, just looking up above, uh, let's pull this down a little bit. Uh, we have x1 bar, x2 bar. These are the two samples right here. We have s1 and n1, s2 and n2 reported. So those are all just plug and chug values. Uh, that leaves only one thing we have to really spend a little bit of effort on uh, figuring out, and that is what is the critical value of t? If it was z and we wanted a 90% confidence interval, immediately I could use 1.645 as that value. It's one of the big three that we often use for Z. But now we have T, and we know this depends on degrees of freedom. So we have to put a little bit of effort into this. All right, so let's just recall. Okay, if I've got some T distribution like this. Uh, if I have a 90% confidence interval, I want that window of values that contains uh, 0 0.9 of the data in the middle. And that leaves 5% in the upper and lower tails. So the alpha here is 0.1, because that's what remains from 
and we put half of that in the upper and half of that in the lower tail. And that's why we use this alpha over two expression here. All right, so we are curious to get this critical value of t, t 0 0.05 alpha over two. And we also know that we have to have the degrees of freedom um, in the problem. So, previously, degrees of freedom we just went n minus 1. I'll go previously up here. Now that I have an n1 and an n2, what's my rule? Well, the degrees of freedom is the minimum of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So you basically go back up to your n values, okay, 33 and 60. You take the smallest one and subtract one from it. Okay, so it's the min of, in this case, 33 minus 1 and 60 minus 1, which is 32. So that's my degrees of freedom, 32. I'm going to pull you back over here and put 32 in right there. Okay. So, I then go to my T table and I do as good a job as I can on T 0 0.05 with 32 degrees of freedom. And if I don't have exactly the entry for 32, that's okay. Uh, let's check. Okay, so now we're uh, ready to fill in the uh, formula. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, and, and I'm talking about this formula up here. Okay, so we go x1 bar, which is 66.1 minus x2 bar, which is 61, plus or minus t alpha over 2 with 32 degrees of freedom, and we found that number to be 1.697, or round to 1.7, whatever you want, uh, multiplied by the square root of S1 squared, that's 21.2 squared, over N1, 33, plus S2 squared, 23.2 squared, over N2, which is 60. When you work all this out, you get 5.1 uh, plus or minus 1.697 times 4.75. And so uh, this interval goes from minus 2.8 nine seven five to positive thirteen point one seven five that's a ninety percent confidence interval for the for the difference in population means now um, we can add a little bit of interpretation to this interval the ninety percent confidence interval um, again, it's saying that we expect the true population difference in the two means to lie in this interval 90% of the time. And one thing that we often look at in these intervals uh, for differences is whether or not they contain zero. Uh, and if you look at this one, this definitely stretches over to a negative value. So this interval contains zero. And so if my interval does spread across to the negative side, uh, I'd say this is not strong evidence that the difference is positive.
and difference being positive means uh, females outperform males in statistics. Now, the data does have females outperforming males, but we're saying it's not statistically significant. Uh, or it appears not, because that's containing zero, that this interval spreads across zero. Now, that's not the same thing as doing a hypothesis test. It's connected to the idea, but it's not quite the same thing. So uh, what we're going to do now is uh, a hypothesis test using the same data just to see uh, what the argument looks like and what the structure looks like. Um, so I'm going to get a new sheet here. We have, okay, line seven. And we'll try it out. So test at alpha equals 0 0.05 that females outperform males. All right, I'm gonna use the same structure I always use. There's gonna be a little bit of change in, uh, in uh, some of the formulas, uh, but otherwise it's the structure that is the same. All right, so let's go at it. Uh, same step-by-step -step process, step one, is always formulate the hypotheses. We have the null hypothesis, we have the alternative hypothesis, and now we're making a hypothesis about comparing mu1 and mu2. And so at the null, we assume that there is no difference, and at the alternative, we're trying to show that there is a difference, in this case, the females have a higher mean uh, midterm score than the males. So at the null, we assume they're equal. So always we're making assumptions about the population parameters, not the statistics for the sample. So I would say mu1 equals mu2 at the null. Now I'm just going to write this in a slightly different format over here because often we refer to differences. Okay, So the difference here is hypothesized to be zero. That's another way to say that same statement. Now the alternative is that the females outperform males having a higher mean. Now the females were one, the males were two, so that's mu1 bigger than mu2. And if I write that in difference form, that means that mu1 minus mu2 should be positive, greater than zero. Now, because of this positive sign, uh, or greater than sign, sorry, uh, this is one-tailed, not a two-tailed test. If it was not equal to, it would be a two-tailed test, but it's one-tailed and it's upper-tailed. Okay, It's going to be in the upper region that we're looking uh, for that, that rejection region. All right. We also ask at this stage, no point in going further if we are not confident that uh, this is all going to, uh, that our assumptions are going to hold. So we ask, do we have a large sample? And a large sample in this case, we need N1 bigger than 25 and N2 bigger than 25. Now N1 is equal to 33 and N2 is equal to 60. So they're both good. Okay, Both are uh, passing our, our bar for classifying them as large. All right. The second thing we do is the test statistic. This is the value of t that we will use to characterize how far away from the null hypothesized difference, which is zero, uh, that our statistics are suggesting. Now the formula goes like this. The t value is the sample difference minus the null hypothesized difference, which is always going to be zero. Okay, I'm going to label this null hypothesized difference. And in every example you see, that will be zero. So we're just going to leave it as zero. Um, sometimes you see a, 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 a D0 for the null hypothesized difference, but we're just going to always assume it's zero. And on the formula sheet, it's zero. Okay, so there's the sample difference minus the null hypothesized difference, always zero divided by the standard deviation, okay? 
the standard deviation is the root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Estimated from the sample uh, data s1 and s2 instead of since we don't know the the population standard deviations. All right, now we already worked out that standard deviation before, so now I can just plug in these these values. Okay, so this is the 66.1 minus 61 minus 0, all over the previously calculated standard deviation of 4.75. We did that for the confidence interval, and we get a value of 1.073. Already I'm feeling like that. Ah, that's probably not quite far enough to land in our rejection region, but I'm going to run through the stats and check this. So the third thing I do is compute this rejection region. So this is the area beyond, or the value beyond which we land in the, in the region of T values that would suggest that we can reject the null and accept the alternative. So we want to build up that rejection region and then check whether or not this 1.073 lies in it or does not lie in it. And that's going to lead to our conclusion. And again, just to remind you, this is the different way to approach these problems versus the p-value because we are using the t-table, and the t-table uh, doesn't allow us to compute a p-value. Uh, so here we go, rejection region. This is my t-distribution. And... It's an upper-tailed test, and the alpha was 0 0.05. So this critical value here is t, 0 0.05, and 32. Now again, we've already looked that value up. We just did it for the confidence interval, because that just happened to have 5% in the upper and lower parts and 90% in the middle. So it's corresponding to the same value. But just to remind you, we'll go approximately equal to 1.697 from the table. Now, the 1.073, my test statistic I computed, lands right about here, okay, 1.07, whereas this value is 1.697. I'm not in the rejection region. I have to be beyond that threshold 1.697 value in order to be statistically significantly far enough from that null hypothesized difference of zero. And I'm not there. I'm only 1.07, uh, so I'm not there. So I'm left with my conclusion, okay? And I would say since T is 1.073 less than 1.697, The test statistic does not lie in rejection region. And if it does not lie in the rejection region, we do not have sufficient evidence to reject the null and accept the alternative. And so in the absence of that evidence, we fail to reject H0, and we do not accept the alternative HA, which again is kind of like doing nothing, right? We don't reject, but we also don't accept. Uh, I can make a statement like there is insufficient evidence to claim that females outperform males. Now I do want to make one small comment here. Uh, sometimes the idea of failing to reject the null is misinterpreted as accepting the null. Now in this context, accepting the null hypothesis would be saying that males and females perform the same in Stats 101. There's no evidence to say that they're performing the same. In fact, the evidence still uh, has females outperforming the males. We're simply saying that there's not strong enough, the difference is not large enough uh, versus the, the variability of the data to make a statistically significant claim beyond some threshold of, of uh, making an error. It does not say anything about the fact that males and females are performing the same 
just that I don't have enough evidence to say that there is a difference. And that's a really important uh, dis distinction to make. All right, just so we're all feeling pretty ironclad about this process of uh, hypothesis testing in a, a difference of means, we're going to do one more example. I'm going to get a new sheet up here. Uh, we'll do one more example, and then uh, we'll leave this be. So this example comes from good old Maclean's magazine. Uh, you might remember every uh, once in a while, Maclean's will publish information about how much students uh, party. Uh, well, COVID-19 has certainly probably taken a bite out of that. But uh, a couple of years ago, uh, St. of X was making national news because we were the party school, uh, so to speak, uh, in Canada. Uh, we had the most hours per week partying. Um, so if you looked at that data, St. of X spent, uh, according to the, the reports of those surveyed, uh, students spent on average 7.5 hours per week partying. Which, I don't know, I guess is a lot. Uh, what we're going to do is compare this to Acadia, and we're going to see, is there a significant difference in the amount of partying done by St. of X students and Acadia students? And some of the data is not available, so we're going to have to try to infer it or fill it in somehow. All right, so if you look at the same survey, Acadia, which we'll call the 2 class. All right, so the, the mean partying by Acadia we'll call X2 bar. And that was equal to 5 uh, hours a week. I got my equal sign over there. Okay, there we go. Now, the sample size, they didn't tell us. We want to know what is N1 and N2, uh, but it's not published. So I need to give you these values to do the question, so I'm going to do a little bit of side work here to make a guess as to what these values are. All right, so the only thing they said is in the whole survey of all of Canada, they sampled uh, 23,000 undergrads. So my uh, assumption is going to be that the proportion of undergrads attending St. of X over the entire population of Canadian undergraduates is going to re be represented by their proportion of the sample. Okay, so if you look at the numbers, St. of X... We're about 4,500, depending on how you count things. Uh, the total undergrads in Canada, it's about uh, 2.048 million. And so I'm going to guess that St. of X appears in the sample uh, at the same proportion as St. of X students appear as a proportion of the total undergraduate population. All right. So that would be 4,500 over 2.048 million students is going to be the N1 over the 23,000. Now, you don't have to know how to do this computation. I'm just doing this to, to generate some value so we can do the question. Generally, I'll give you the N1 and the N2 in the question. All right. So a little bit of cross-multiplication here gives you N1. Okay, and if you work it out, N1 is approximately equal to 50. So it's reasonable to think that they surveyed about 50 students here for St. of X. Now, Acadia is a bit smaller, 3,485 students, but we do the same approach to guess what their N2 is, what proportion of the 23,000 students were Acadia students, and you get N2 approximately equal to uh, 40 if you work that out. Now also the standard deviations also not reported. Um, but I looked at the data a little bit and I'm just going to make uh, an educated guess that S1 and S2 are going to be about 4. That seems to be approximately reasonable. So if you think of seven hours of partying, plus or minus four hours of partying, uh, that would get you about three to 11 to 12 around there. And uh, you think of, you know, if let's say roughly 70% of the data li lies in there, that seems to about make sense. 
Okay, so we're just kind of, you know, building this up as best we can in the absence of full data. And so I just want to summarize this now. We have the one class, which is sine of x. We have x1 bar equaling 7.5. We have s1 equaling 4. And we have n1 equaling 50, the approximate sample size. We have the two class being Acadia. x2 bar was equal to 5. s2 is our estimated value of 4. And n2 was 40. There's all of our data. Okay, we want to make a hypothesis test. Um, and we're going to test here the hypothesis. That x students party at a different rate. There's that magic word. Different. Now that's indicating a two-tailed test because I'm not testing for one being greater than or less than the other. Difference. There's going to be an inequality in my <clears throat> in my alternative hypothesis. All right. So X students party at a different rate than Acadia students. Now we know for those surveyed there is a difference, but do we know for the population of students that there's a difference? That's the essential question. We're using these little... Uh, samples to infer about the the behavior of the entire school and so we have to ask ourselves is this significant or is it not and I'm going to use a level of significance that's the alpha of 0 0.05 and just so we have our terminology this is a test for the difference in two population means. And your skill that's so important to develop here is when you look at a question, you figure out which of the categories you're in. Is it proportion or is it mean? Obviously, we have x1 bar, x2 bar, so it's suggesting means here. Uh, and then is it one sample or two sample? And we have sine of x and Acadia, one and two, so there's two samples here. It's really important that you, you allow that information to get you to hone in on the right box on the formula sheet. Okay. Let's do it. One, set up your hypotheses. Alternative HA, null H0. At the null, we assume that the mean amount of partying is the same at sine of x in Acadia. And at the alternative, we assume that the mean hours spent partying per week is different. And so all I'm going to say is mu1 not equal to mu2. Okay, it doesn't matter if the difference is positive or negative. We're just testing for that difference. We're just going to remind ourselves that alpha is 0 0.05. And we're also going to check, is it large? N1 was 50, which is bigger than 25. N2 was 40, bigger than 25. So yes, both of them are large. We will continue on. So yes. Step two, calculate your test statistic. Same as last one, x1 bar minus x2. It's the sample difference between uh, the mean partying at x minus the mean partying at Acadia per week minus the null hypothesized difference, which is always zero. You always assume that the same and then divided by that standard deviation estimated from S1 and S2. So there's our formula S2 squared N2. Now, I'm gonna do the standard deviation calculation over here. That's equal to S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2 for for each of the S1 and S2, and then 50 and 40 for N1 and N2. And you work that thing out and you get uh, 0 0.8485. Okay, now I can take X1 bar, which is the 7.5 hours per week for sine of X, minus the five hours a week for Acadia. Let me subtract zero, which does nothing. And we divide that by the 0 0.8485. 
and the result is 2.95. Okay, well, that's a pretty big value, actually. Um, my gut feeling is saying this is going to be statistically significant, but now i got to go through and do my rejection region. And so the rejection region, again, I really want to work out this critical value of t. There's my t distribution. It's an alpha equals 0.05 two-tailed test. And that's going to leave 0.025 in the upper tail and 0.025, half of that 0 0.05 in the lower tail. So I'm curious then, what is this value here for t? Now, if t 0 0.025 and the degrees of freedom is the min of n1 minus 1, n2 minus 1, okay, n1 is 50, n2 is 40, so that's 49 and 39, so that's 39 degrees of freedom, okay? So you walk down here and it's degrees of freedom 39, which is really close to 40. So we'll probably end up using the 40 uh, row in the T table. And we've got the 0 0.025 as that area above. All right, so we take this thing and we go to the table or so. All right. So there's my threshold value. 2.95 is my test statistic. So I'm just going to redraw this just so it's clear what's going on. Okay, so we found in this t distribution the value that leaves 0 0.025 above and below is 2.02, and this would be negative 2.02 over here. The test statistic is 2.95, okay? Over here. Now, 2.95 is larger than 2.02. That lands me in the shaded region, and that says I'm far enough away from the null hypothesized difference in the means, which is zero. I'm far enough away from that that I land in this region beyond the 2.02, okay? So the chance of making an error is less than the alpha, 0 0.05, and so I'm confident that I can go ahead and make my uh, rejection of the null accept the alternative uh, hypothesis. All right, so I use that, and I'm just gonna, in words here, say, in rejection region. And rejection region, so named because I reject the null and then accept the alternative. Not about rejecting the alternative. Okay, so step four, make your conclusion. Since t equals 2.95 is larger than 2.02, which was my t 0 0.02539, the test statistic lies in the rejection region so I reject the null and I accept the alternative HA and then finally I make my statement in the words of the original question so at this point I would say there is evidence for a difference in hours per week partying at St. of X versus Acadia. All right. So yeah, we do party a little bit more here, it turns out, and that's statistically significant based on the assumptions that I made here. You can either be proud of that or not proud of that, depending on your perspective.
That is two examples of a hypothesis test for a difference in population means. One category of these tests that you got to keep straight. So here we go. The upper tail probability is 0 0.05 that I'm after. Degrees of freedom is 32. And you can see I walk down here. It's the second column. And I get to 30. And then I don't have 31 through 39. I just jump up to 40. So in this case, with 32, it, uh, I'm, I'm pretty lax about this. I'm completely okay with you rounding to the value for 30, which is 1.697. Or you can make it just 1.69, slightly lower. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me that much. I'm not worried about 0 0.01 uh, error in your uh, critical T value. So let's just use the value that's closest to, let's say 30, so 1.697. And again, uh, any testing will be set up so that this is, this is not gonna be marked wrong if you're off by a tiny little bit. So 1.6, okay. We're looking at the 0 0.05 upper tail probability. And we go down to 32, which, you know, uh, 30 is as close as we can get. So it's 1.697. Pop over here. All right, our good old table. There's the 0 0.025 column okay for the upper tail probability so 0 0.025 in the upper tail okay also 0 0.025 in the lower tail to come to add together to give me my alpha and we walk down until we get to 40. okay so 0 0.025 uh that's as close as we're going to get 2.021 okay where we've taken the 39 and said well it's pretty close to 40 it's the best we can do 2.02 .02. 